Hi guys, um, my internet's a bit slow today, and um, I'm just not going to turn on my video, uh, and I don't know why, this is a little bit stuck, and it won't, okay, there we go. Um, so we're going to pick up where we last left off, uh, last left off uh, which is about um, how different immunological uh, diagnostics and, and research tools work. Um, so, so we covered um, a lot of them in the last lecture, uh, things like, um, you know, the very basic types of techniques like agglutination, uh, immunoprecipitation, ELISAs, lateral flow, western blot. Those are <clears throat> very, very common um, tools that are used both um, for diagnostics as well as uh, for research. And we're just going to continue more um, on... Um, cell-based uh, types of assays because the, the previous ones were, were largely limited to protein and antibodies. So that's part two. Uh, we're going to cover uh, Ellis spot, uh, surface plasma and resonance, um, <clears throat> immunofluorescence imaging, and flow cytometry. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about flow cytometry because it's a very powerful uh, tool in immunology uh, and in the others where it will, we'll cover uh, a bit more briefly. So the first one uh, is the Ellis spot assays. So the Ellis spot assays uh, work quite similarly to how uh, ELISA's work, uh, which we, we are very familiar with now. So it involves a, a microteter plate, um, but instead of detecting an antibody or an antigen, uh, we're detecting uh, cytokines released from, from uh, live cells. So the Ellis spot assays enables quantitative determination of the number of cells in a population producing a particular type of molecule. So for example, <clears throat> if you want to find out how many natural killer T cells uh, um, are actually producing interferon, you can use an Ellis spot for that. <clears throat> and the Ellis spot basically has a capture antibody, so that's the antibody that's immobilized on the surface of the well, um, and this antibody recognizes interferon. Um, <clears throat> then you add the cells uh, at an appropriate concentration, you stimulate them. So this is where you actually um, um, see whether or not they've been activated uh, with forbol, amyristol, acetate, and ionomycin. <clears throat> this, the cells will settle onto the surface of the plate, and then any interferon secreted by these stimulated cells um, will be captured by antibodies. Um, then you wash off the cells, so all you have left are uh, cytokines that are stuck to the antibodies stuck on the wells. Um, and then you add biotin conjugated <clears throat> antibodies that recognize interferon, uh, gamma, for example. Um, and then the excess antibodies are removed and you add strep avidin, because remember when you use biotin, you use strep avidin um, to detect. Um, <clears throat> and this strep avidin is conjugated uh, or labeled with ALP. Um, and then you add a substrate, uh, which is colorless, but then turns uh, brown or black <clears throat> uh, once there is actually a, a biotin detected. So where there are uh, cytokines bound onto the well, then you will see a brown-black spot. So how that works, you've got the <clears throat> antigen-stimulated cells that are transferred onto these plates that already have the antibodies uh, that detect the interferon, so they're stimulated, and then you add the um, anti-cytokine antibody, uh, and then the substrate, and then you'll see the black spot. So this is how uh, a well in an L spot assay might look like. So you see those brown, dark black spots, kind of a bit shady, blurry spots. So that actually represents the site where a cell secreted interferon. So if you count each spot, you basically are counting uh, the natural killer cells that secreted that interferon. So it gives you a, an idea of the, the, the number of cells. <clears throat> Another method, um, this very fancy method, um, uh, is called surface plasmon residence, or SPR. It's a rapid and sensitive method, um, and it also tells you um, about antigen-antibody reaction rates or affinity. So, so <clears throat> I, I lied to you a little bit. Uh, this second part isn't just about cells because SPR doesn't actually uh, isn't usually used uh, to measure cells. 
Um, it's usually used to uh, measure uh, small molecules as well as antigens and antibodies. But it's one of the um, more more sophisticated, uh, more expensive, less common tools that I thought would belong in the second part. So how is it different from a lot of other techniques? Well, SPR relies on electromagnetic waves called surface plasmons that will propagate at the interface of a metal and a solvent. So this wave, as it's running through the um, uh, solvent, um, as it's running through the surface, is very sensitive to any changes within the boundary of this surface. So for example, you've got a surface of a chip that you've immobilized some antibodies on. So the antibodies will have a shape, right? So when the wave is running through, it will it will be very it will pick up any changes to the surface that's made by the antibody bound or the protein bound, for example. So <clears throat> when it detects these changes um, through the reflectance properties, um, then it will uh, be able to measure it in in, in electrical uh, 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 current, basically. So. Um, this, this is a, an example of how, how you would see um, the sample flowing through a cell or a flow chamber um, in uh, SPR. So you'll have, uh, for example, these antibodies that are immobilized and you'll have targets. Um, and <clears throat> you'll have um, the, the targets binding the antibodies at some point and the plasmon wave is going running through. So they'll, they'll be able to detect, like, this is the antibody without the targets and this is the antibody with the targets. So this will, will, this will change, um, basically, the resonant angle or the beam of polarized light. Um, and this is detected, uh, um, um, this change is detected um, when the complex is formed. Um, so... Yeah, so basically um, the beam of polarized light directed on the chip is reflected off and collected by a sensor um, and you can see any sharp dip in the reflected light intensity is basically called the uh, resonant angle. So this will depend on <clears throat> the light, the thickness, uh, conductivity of the metal film uh, and other optical properties of the material on the surface. But in short, when you measure the rate at which the resonant angle changes during the reaction, you can also determine the rate of the antigen antibody uh, binding reaction. So it, it's a bit different. It doesn't tell you like a yes or no. It's not about whether it binds or it doesn't bind. It actually tells you, does the antigen bind the antibody slowly? Does it bind the antibody quickly? Does it stick longer? Does it dissociate very fast? So those all give you some idea about the affinity. So if you remember the K value, um, for the um, for for calculating the the binding of um, different molecules, so this this basically shows you um, a plot of the resonance signal versus time. So you'll have um, the antibodies uh, that are already immobilized, and then the targets that will be binding. So that's the association curve, um, and then it will start dissociating. And then they'll they'll regenerate, which means get rid of all the um, ant targets that have uh, bound, um, and then you get uh, basically the um, the the chip or the um, chamber that is now free of the targets. And this entire loop will give you an idea um, of the the uh, rate of association and dissociation, which will give you the affinity value uh, for these two uh, antibodies uh, antigens so so that was SPR um, now we talk about the use of antibodies for things like uh, imaging yeah so that's a very powerful use of uh, antibodies um, for example immunocytochemistry uh, and immunohistochemistry um, use enzyme conjugated antibodies so that you can differentiate different parts uh, of a tissue based on the specific binding of that antibody to that specific uh, molecule or structure. The only difference between the cyto and the histo part is that histo means you're applying these uh, labeled antibodies um, on intact tissue and cyto means you're applying these antibodies on cells, isolated cells. So these are usually in, in a suspension. 
And this is a, a nice photo just showing um, where you have a, a lymph node um, that is stained with an antibody to CD4. So that will tell you where the CD4 cells are basically. So that's the red stain cells. And then it's counter stayed with a hematoxylin, which is in blue. So the other cells that are not CD4 are in blue and then the CD4 cells are in, are in red. Um, uh, a, a variation of this is uh, using antibody uh, that are bound to gold beads. So when you bind it to a, a heavy metal like gold, um, you can use it uh, as staining for the electron microscope. So um, when the antibodies bind, you can see uh, these uh, where it's bound when you see these um, basically gold deposits. It's very dark gold deposits. So you can you can see, for example, in pic figure 215, uh, an immuno electron micrograph of a B, lymph B cell lymphoma that's stained with two antibodies. So one is against class 2 MHC, um, so that's a, a 30 Mommy, nanometer gold particle, so it's slightly bigger. And then another against MHC Why? class 1, labeled with a 50 nanometer gold particle. So, so the difference in sizes kind of gives you an indication of the difference um, in what it's binding. So, okay, apologies for that. All right, so um, that was uh, immuno um, gold uh, for electron microscopy. Then you also have immunofluorescence. So this is when antibodies are conjugated with fluorescent dyes. Um, and you may have already learned about this uh, if you took BOT205 uh, microscopy and histology. Um, this is also a very powerful tool. You, you can use it for fluorescent microscopy as well as confocal microscopy. And both allow you to differentiate several types of um, um, structures or molecules on, on living cells. Um, and you, you'll be able to uh, even actually see them um, in motion and, and, and in a dynamic way. Um, so this is an example of uh, human dendritic cells. Um, and you have a green fluorescence uh, from Alexa Fluor 488 labeling. Um, and it binds actin uh, filaments, uh, and then the red fluorescence from uh, red fluorescent protein, which is expressed by the bacteria itself, and then the DNA, uh, where you see the nucleus is, um, is stained with DAPI, sort of common DNA stain. So you can see quite quite a few things. Like you can see where they're distributed, whether they'll they'll be moving about. So so those are really really powerful tools for you to study um, living cells. Um, all right, so this is our, uh, I think, our, our, our last um, uh, tool or, 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 or method um, in immunology uh, or that uses immunological um, concepts and, and materials. Uh, so this is flow cytometry. So it's a very powerful tool. It's an analytical technique that quantifies the frequencies of cells binding to fluorescent antibodies and the scattering of light in different ways. Um, and uh, there's also an extension of flow cytometry that is called uh, FACS, Fluorescence Activated Cell Sorter, um, which is where once you've identified the populations of the cells, you can also pull them out from the sample and you can sort them. So that's really helpful. Like if you have basically, uh, for example, um, some uh, po a population of cells from a, a blood sample of a patient, um, then you, you, you kind of want to see, okay, uh, what are the populations of T cells like? What are the populations of B cells like? What are the population of neutrophils like? Uh, so you label them accordingly, and then you're able to see them on the graph, and you, you can quantify that. And then with the facts, you can actually pull them out, and then you can do other things later on uh, with those different subpopulations uh, of, of cells. So, so that's, that's the adaptation to, to flow cytometry. But how does flow cytometry work? Basically, it consists of three main systems, which are the fluidics, the optics, and the electronics. Um, the fluidics transports particles in a string to the laser beam for interrogation. 
the optic system will shine the light on the particles in the sample stream. Um, and then there'll be some optical filters as well to direct the resulting light to detectors to collect the signal. And then you have an electronic system that converts the detected light into electronic signals. This is usually how a lot of these sensor-based things uh, work or, or um, um, yeah, it, it, when you have a beam that, that is going to be uh, collected, it then will later be uh, transformed into electronic signals, uh, which gets processed in the computer. Um, right, so if you have a fax adapter, then it will actually initiate a sorting decision uh, to charge and deflect the droplets uh, once it's detected that this is the particle that I want to separate from the rest of the population, and then it'll put it into the collection tube. So it's very, very fancy. Um, so how it works. Uh, just explain, you've got the three basic components, but what happens is you have your sample, and the sample is usually, have a, you, you insert it once, you inject it once it's already been stained with specific uh, fluorescent dyes. Um, so this, this enters um, and is carried by a sheaf of fluid. Uh, and what's, inter what's, what's important is in this process, there is hydrodynamic focusing, which focuses your samples into one single stream of cells meaning you don't have two cells or three cells at a particular uh, point in time. And especially when it reaches the interrogation point here where the laser light beams through, um, you only have one cell at one time because all of them are lined up very nicely. That allows you to get the information just from a single cell at one time. And that information is basically the light scattering. So it can be the forward and side scattering just because the light's hitting the cells. And then it will be the scattering from the fluorescence that's emitted uh, after the laser light has been applied. Uh, so all of these give you a lot of information about the shape, the possible size, the granularity. And if you have a fluorescence against specific markers, you'll also know what kind of cells these are based on the markers that they have. So a key part of uh, flow cytometry being able to work is this hydrodynamic uh, focusing. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. There's a lot of words here that you can read. Um, but the idea is that you ha you're applying the sample with uh, pressure. And the sample and the sheath fluid pressure are always different. The sample pressure always exceeds the sheath fluid pressure. The sheath fluid pressure is the blue the one in blue that's surrounding the sample core, and this is the flow cell where it's flowing through. So the sample pressure uh, is what actually changes um, the flow or how, how, how the sample will flow inside the flow cell. Um, and that determines whether or not you get that hydrodynamic focusing uh, to get that single line of cells. Um, and this is all based on uh, fluid dynamic principles and laminar flow. So you can, can read uh, the, the paragraph above. Um, should be more familiar with that concept. Another very important concept from, from uh, flow cytometry is the light scattering. So if you did take BOT205, you may recall that a very important property of light is how it scatters. That gives you a lot of outcomes, basically. Um, and in the case of uh, flow cytometry, it tells you a lot of information. So I just mentioned just now, uh, the physical characteristics, the size, the inter internal complexity or the granularity. Um, and if you've got fluorescence as well, then the markers that's present there. Um, what's important to remember for uh, flow cytometry is all the forward scattered light is proportional to cell surface area and size. And the side scatter light or the SSC is proportional to cell granularity or internal complexity. So this is a nice picture. Um, that kind of gives you uh, that uh, visual. So you've got the light source. This is a cell. The, these dots are all the internal complexities of that cell. And um, obviously this is the size of the cell. And all that light scattering forward tells you basically how big the cell is um, and how maybe how wide it is. And then the side scatter is because of the light going through the cell and hitting all these other structures within the cell. So that will give you information. And then the flow cytometer um, will represent this information uh, in different graphs that you can choose on the computer. A very common graph that you see from a flow cytometer uh, or for, from flow cytometry experiments is this dot plot. So this, these, these 
dots are actually all representing different populations of cells because they all have, um, we, they're all within a range of size and a range of internal complexity. So for example, you've got lymphocytes where you they have basically the least forward scatter because they're a bit smaller. Um, and they also have the least uh, side scatter because they don't have a lot of uh, granules. They're not granular sites, right? And then you have monocytes somewhere in between. They're bigger um, and have a bit more um, granularity. And then neutrophils would be uh, at the top, top right, because they're the bigger ones and they also have more granularity within their cells. So just, just by this virtue, you can actually separate the subpopulations and you can see um, how many there are, um, how, how, uh, and what the range of their sizes are. So, so a lot of information. Um, yeah, so, so how, how does it work? Um, basically, this, this is just a bit more detail about how the uh, signal is detected. So you've got the laser. That's, this, is the, this, this is the interrogation point, basically, where the laser is uh, shining through. So you've got the cell moving, the cell hits the laser, the cell passes, right? And you'll see on top the voltage and uh, over time. So you get the, the rise and then the drop. And that will give you the signal that will be translated in the computer. Um, another very important aspect of the flow cytometer is it, when you're using fluorescence. Uh, and usually, people will use multiple uh, fluorescent dyes when they're using flow cytometers because they want to know as many markers present on the cells as possible. And modern flow cytometers um, can detect 8 to 12 fluorescence and light scattering parameters. So, so quite a lot of information there, quite a lot of fluorescence uh, that will be detected as well. Um, so when you have a lot of these fluorescence, I mean, there's going to be what you call bleeding, fluorophore bleeding into neighboring um, um, detectors. So you'll have detectors for specific fluorescence, uh, the, their specific wavelength or wavelength ranges, but there will be some overlap. So if you look at this picture, figure 3.8, you have the first fluorescence uh, in green and then the second fluorescence in red, and you'll, you'll see where it's uh, 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 most intense um, somewhere in the middle of that wavelength range, but then there'll, there'll be some tail ends that will uh, bleed into the next channel or, or the next uh, detector. And so that will give you some, some, some noise and some problems in the data analysis. So there's a technique in flow cytometry called compensation. And compensation is important so that you can subtract any unwanted fluorescence of a fluor fluorophore bleeding into neighboring detectors. Um, and once you've done the compensation, then you, you can be fairly confident that whatever fluorescence uh, that you're seeing um, from the graphs are, are real. Um, so there are different formats that you can show. So just now we saw um, just the side scatter and the forward scatter. Now you're looking at different uh, detectors uh, for different fluorescence and whether or not this population has the CD4 marker, for example, um, or the CD8 marker. Um, so this is CD8 versus the CD4 molecule. And you've got basically three different populations um, that have um, uh, these markers. Right, and that takes us to the end of this lecture. Uh, and basically, um, you have different um, techniques that you can use, and we went through a very vast majority of them. Um, and it, there are different sensitivities. Of course, sensitivity isn't the only thing that you want to use to judge whether or not a method is good. There's also cost, there's also complexity, and what information you need. But but sensitivity is, is an indication of how powerful the tool is in general. So you can see tools like uh, RIA and flow cytometry um, uh, can be quite sensitive. Uh, ELISA's as well, um, compared to tools like precipitation or agglutination. So those the, the ones that are less sensitive typically require more sample. Um, and can't detect this as low um, presence of analytes. All right, so that's basically it for uh, part two of Diagnostics in Research. And in the next lecture, um, we'll go into um, organ transplantation. Thanks.